Say goodbye to your vanilla ice cream, friends, because it's on the verge of going extinct. The only thing that may be able to save it is this. Beaver butt. Hello, internet! Welcome to Food Theory, the show that's spicy in the streets and vanilla in the sheets. Sheet cakes, that is. Of course, that's what I'm talking about. You know, of all the flavors out there, vanilla kind of gets itself a bad rap. I mean, it's the word that's outright used to describe something plain, boring, and flavorless. Like, I think I speak on behalf of all former kids out there when I say that I legit grew up believing that vanilla ice cream was just like the base flavor of ice cream. It was what all ice cream was until you decided to mix in whatever the real flavor was gonna be. Like chocolate chocolate to make chocolate ice cream or cookie pieces to make cookies and cream. In the eyes of the world, vanilla is merely the layover flight on your way to more exotic flavor destinations. But despite its humble public persona, the business of vanilla is anything but plain. In the past few years, vanilla has ascended to become the second most expensive spice in the world, second only to saffron. In fact, vanilla is worth more than its weight in silver, reaching nearly $700 per kilogram at its peak. But what makes vanilla, of all things, so expensive? After all, vanilla comes from a bean, right? Aren't beans famously one of the cheapest and easiest to grow foods around? Well, first of all, let's just dispel that myth right here. Vanilla isn't actually a bean, much like peanuts aren't actually nuts or blackberries aren't actually berries. What we call a vanilla bean is actually a fruit, specifically the fruit of a specific type of orchid. And orchids, unlike beans, are notoriously hard to grow. Ask anyone who's tried to maintain a home garden, they are one of the hardest flowers to grow. You need to be close to the equator so it's warm, but it can't be in a desert because the vanilla orchid needs a healthy amount of water to grow, but too much heavy rainfall can also damage this delicate plant. Therefore, it needs an environment with taller plants that can protect it from the sun and the harsh rainfalls. Not only that, but the pollination period for vanilla just lasts a few hours of a single day of the year. So if you miss your pollination window, too bad you lost your chance. And that's pretty darn devastating because it takes upwards of three years of growth before a vanilla plant grows to the point that it can produce fruit. And we're not even done. Humans, of course, have managed to make this difficult situation even worse. There were some rainforests in Central America that used to be the perfect environment for the vanilla plant, but due to deforestation, these areas no longer are able to support them. Good job, humanity. Slow clap. As a result, 80% of the world's vanilla is now grown on the African island of Madagascar. Except, there's a problem with that one too. You see, vanilla is native to Mexico. It was originally brought over to Europe by Spanish conquistadors, but because Europe's climate wasn't right for the plant, no one had any success cultivating it there. Eventually, they figured out that they should probably ship the plant to other similar climates, hence it winding up in Madagascar. But as you might imagine, that's a long way away from home for a Latin American plant, which adds itself a whole other layer of problems. Well, Madagascar, had imported the vanilla plant, they hadn't imported the entire ecosystem to go along with it. In short, the rainforests of Madagascar don't have the kinds of insects and birds that would be natural pollinators for the vanilla plant. Which means vanilla orchids growing in Madagascar need to be pollinated by hand. Human hands. And unlike the birds and the bees, human pollinators expect to be paid at the end of their shift. And while we're on the subject of climate, this isn't even touching the fact that when you're in a rainforest on an island that close to the equator, cyclones are a real problem, and a single cyclone can completely wipe out the three-year investment that you just made in those vanilla plants. And we are still not done, because remember, we're talking about the world's second most expensive spice, and humans are the worst. Those two factors combine to make vanilla a huge target for theft. Plants growing in a tropical rainforest don't exactly have themselves the best surveillance and security systems, and the vanilla is just hanging out on the vine for a period of six months while it's maturing. That is a huge window of opportunity for would-be thieves. And after after you've stolen that vanilla, it's pretty darn easy to fence. It's not like selling a stolen TV or an iPhone that has a serial number that can be tracked. These things are just plants. To combat the increasing levels of theft, some vanilla producers have actually started physically stamping their plants to identify them as their own, like an old school rancher branding their cattle. But again, it is yet another layer in this manual, time-intensive, awful process, all meant to get you a bowl full of plain vanilla ice cream. In short, vanilla is an extremely risky business with extreme 
extremely volatile prices. Can you start to see why vanilla might be more of a problem than it's worth? And when there's that much money on the line, companies start getting creative, finding ways to cut corners, find alternatives, and sneak in synthetic substitutes. Which brings us to the topic of today, vanilla as you know it is going extinct. Over the last few years, you've shown the food industry that you're okay with substitutes, and they are more than happy to provide. Remember that $700 per kilogram figure I mentioned earlier in the video? Well, that's when vanilla prices peaked in around 2018. In 2020, at the height of the pandemic, the price of vanilla crashed nearly 50% from that number, with Madagascar rushing to try and set a minimum price floor of $350 per kilo, otherwise their economy would crumble. Several analysts speculated that there were two main reasons for that 2020 price crash. One, decreased demand from restaurants. Makes sense, no one was eating out. But more importantly, there was also point number two, an uptick in home cooking and baking. At first, that might not make a whole lot of sense. Most baking recipes require vanilla in there somewhere, and if there are more people baking, that should translate to more vanilla sales, right? Wrong. I checked several local groceries, and the going price for a tiny two-ounce bottle of all-natural vanilla extract goes for anything between $7 and $10, depending on the brand. Ten bucks for a bottle that you could chug in a single swig. On the other hand, an eight-ounce bottle of imitation vanilla made with artificial flavors costs less than a dollar. Four times the amount of stuff for one-tenth the price. Suddenly, when home cooks had to do their own grocery shopping, they decided that when it comes to vanilla, all natural flavors aren't really worth the cost. This wouldn't be the first time that people have turned to replacements in search for that vanilla flavor. You may have heard an old urban legend about how food companies would flavor food using goo from beaver butts. No? Am I the only one interested in the history of butt goo? Fine, unsurprising. Well, regardless, in the early 1900s, people discovered an amazing new substance called castoreum. This milky yellow goo was able to be used in both perfumes and as a food additive because of its smoky smell with hints of floral vanilla. There's just one problem. Castoreum exudes from a beaver's castor sac. A, um, how to put this delicately? A scent sac that's located near the anal gland. If you're wondering why beavers would excrete this sort of pungent goo, it's for the purpose of marketing their territory. You know, once you've mixed it with the requisite urine, of course. In recent years, there's been a movement toward banning the use of castoreum. Not because people are grossed out by the idea of a food additive coming from a beaver butt, but because it's actually hard to procure in a way that's safe and humane for beavers. In some cases, hunters would just straight up kill the beavers to get to it, though technically you can harvest it from a more delicate procedure, provided you're willing to poke your fingers in places that no human fingers should dare to go. That being said, if you're wondering how much beaver butt goo is actually in your food in place of regular vanilla, rest easy friends, consumption is really low. As of 2010, only about 300 pounds of the stuff was being consumed annually. I realize that 300 pounds might sound like a lot of butt gunk, but to put it in perspective, that is a tiny fraction of the amount of vanillin that's produced each year, around one-tenth of one percent. If this 5,000 by 5,000 pixel square is the amount of vanillin that we're consuming each year, that one single individual pixel right there, that is the amount of stuff that's coming out of beaver butts and making its way into the food that you eat. And suffice it to say, it's not going into the $2 container of Cool Whip that you're picking up at the local Piggly Wiggly. When food makers sell this stuff, it's being sold as a fancy delicacy. Because food is a weird industry where sometimes you're just able to poop out gold. By the way, notice that I said vanillin, not vanilla in that last paragraph. That wasn't a typo. See, when you take a vanilla bean and extract its components, the primary extract is called vanillin, a chemical compound with the formula C8H8O3. That substance does occur naturally. but mass producing it in a lab is a heck of a lot easier. Hence why your grocery store has artificial synthetic vanilla that is literally less than 5% the price of actual vanilla extract. And from a chemical standpoint, it is the exact same vanillin that you would get from a vanilla plant. The exact same configuration of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. Chemically speaking, they are equivalent. There should be no atomic difference from the vanillin from the lab and the vanillin from the bean. The issue, of course, is that while vanillin is the primary component of vanilla bean extract, it's not the only component. There's lots of other things that subtly contribute to the flavor, and different batches of vanilla extract will taste differently based on how ripe the plant was, or the extraction process itself. Honestly, it's a lot like wine in that sense. Chemistry just isn't enough. The flavor is ultimately affected by the environment around it. That's why food is as much an art as it is a science. That's also why real vanilla and artificial vanilla taste different even when they should basically be the same. Now, if you can't tell the difference between artificially synthesized vanillin and actual vanilla extract, by all means, save your money and opt for the cheap stuff. Vanillin is vanillin, no matter where it comes from. The bad news is, if you can tell the difference, you may not have a choice in the matter. The
The majority of vanillin is artificially produced, and while you can certainly choose between the two if you're baking your own cookies, you don't get to decide between the two when you're buying a package of cookies off the shelf. So, is this supposed to be the part of the episode where I tell you all to begin a letter writing campaign telling your favorite food companies to stop using artificial vanillin and start using the natural stuff? No, and not just for one, but rather two reasons. First off, the substitute is, like I've said, a chemically pure version of the extract that you're trying to get out of a vanilla bean. Is it the exact same flavor? No. Mother Nature makes sure that she's still got her own unique home recipe that labs can't reproduce yet, but it's close. At least close enough to smooth away a 400% cost difference. So if you don't want to be paying extra for that ice cream, artificial is going to be the way to go. But more importantly, there's also point number two. A letter campaign may not actually be necessary at this point. Over the past decade, there's been increased pressure on food companies to ditch artificial flavors. Back in 2015, Hershey and Nestle both made headlines by announcing that they would ditch artificial vanillin for 100% natural vanilla. Ditto for Kellogg's and General Mills. In 2017, McDonald's announced that they would be doing the same thing with its soft serve ice cream. We began this episode by talking about how vanilla prices were skyrocketing, peaking at over $600 per kilogram in 2018. And this is why. Demand for genuine vanilla has reached new heights, with more and more food brands wanting to make the move to the real stuff so that they can advertise that they use no artificial flavors. Instead of trying to cut costs and use the cheapest stuff possible, more and more premium brands are going au naturel, driving vanilla prices higher than ever. So really, there are two very different futures awaiting your scoop of vanilla ice cream. Either companies continue to try and squeeze artificial vanilla into everything, wanting to save money by using a less expensive vanilla substitute, but there's also those that feel compelled to use real vanilla in their products in order to stay all natural. But rest assured, you're going to be feeling that in the price that you pay at the grocery store. Regardless of which vanilla becomes the public's top choice and which goes extinct, let's all just collectively celebrate humanity's good decision of not having to put our fingers where a beaver's sun don't shine just to get a sweet, sweet vanilla substitute. But hey, that's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. And hey, if you feel like your taste buds have been tricked by fake food additives, check out this episode all about how our senses can fool us when it comes to tasting food. Or check out the episode on the right for a look at how vanilla might not be the only flavor of cake mix trying to pull a fast one on ya.